morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I would like to congratulate Don Kerry, Daniela Lulema, and everyone from the Center for Migration Studies and the University of Notre Dame for their leadership in organizing this important virtual conference on building communities of belonging and hope. This is the sixth plenary panel on how Catholic institutions better promote the integration, protection, and defense for migrants, refugees, and families rooted in multiple communities. As you know, the Catholic Church has a long tradition of creating networks of institutions committed with the development of peoples in order to prevent forced migration. In addition of institutions committed with the integration and protection of migrants, refugees and their families, advocating for their dignity and their rights. From this perspective, recognizing the primary responsibility of the states to promote development, policies and programs and respect the rights of migrants, and based on the principle of subsidiarity, the Catholic Church is engaged with the integral human development of all peoples and the integration of migrants and refugees and their families in complementarity with different stakeholders, including governments, uh, civil society organizations, and international organizations. In our own time, migrants and refugees, as we know, are fleeing violent conflicts and wars economic and social imbalances and climate change consequences. They are facing multiple challenges that are exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. Two years ago, on October 29, 2018, addressing the participants of the general chapter of our Scalabrini congregation here in Rome, Pope Francis stated, I thank you for what you do. You are an example. You are also courageous because you often exceed limitations. You take risks. And taking risks is also a characteristic of migrants. They take risks. At times, they even risk their lives. And this is something that helps. See, continue Pope Francis. This is something that helps to be courageous. They know to take risks. The prudence in you has a different tone from a prudence of cloister monk. They are different forms of prudence. Both, both are vi virtues, but with different colors. So take risk. This invitation of Pope Francis to be courageous and take risks are two key elements that can help us to strengthen our work in promoting integration, protection, and defense of migrants, refugees, and their families and communities. In this panel, we will explore how Catholic institutions can strengthen their work in promoting the integration, protection, and defense of persons with strong root in sending and receiving communities. It will consider this challenge at a time of large scale displacement, returns and removals and economic hardship. I'm delighted to moderate this panel with five leaders working courageously in the church with migrants and refugees and in different institutions. They will help us to reflect on how Catholic Church can better promote the integration, protection, and defense for migrants, refugees, their families, rooted, and communities. The panelists' biographies can be found online, and rather than read into it, uh, I will ask each panelist to say a few words about the work they are doing and to give their perspective and opening remarks on the topic of our conversation. Our first panelist is Maruja Assis, the director of the Scalabrini Migration Center based in Manila, Philippines. She is a sociologist 
who has a long been working on in international migration and social change issues in Asia. Um, Maruja, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Father Junior, and good morning to everyone. Uh, allow me also to extend my thanks to the Center for Migration Studies and the University of Notre Dame for organizing this panel and for inviting the Scalabrini Migration Center to be part of the discussion. So just a very brief background about the Scalabrini Migration Center. It is a research center that was established in Manila in 1987. And the purpose of the center is to promote the interdisciplinary and holistic study of migration questions in the Asia Pacific region. So the work that we do and the uh, uh, we hope that the contributions that we make um, are mo mostly in the area of providing research-based uh, evidence and understanding of uh, complex issues surrounding migration in the region in particular. So let me start by saying that the pandemic has been a most trying time for temporary migrant workers in Asia. According to the International Labor Organization, as of 2017, of the 164 million migrant workers, some 20% or about 33 million are in the Asia Pacific region. While temporary labor migration has contributed to the development of countries of origin and countries of destination, the economic benefits of working abroad come with heavy costs for migrants and their families. And a lot of this has to do with how labor migration is organized in our part of the world. The large majority of migrant workers in Asia for them to be able to find work in other countries, they have to go through what are known as recruitment or placement agencies for which they pay hefty amounts. And so though, uh, and thus therefore for many of them, even from the very start of their migration journey, they could already be indebted. But what is also important to remember is that in Asia, temporary labor migration does not provide a pathway for residents for migrant workers in less skilled occupation. So migrant workers are allowed to work and stay in the countries of destination for the duration of their contract. And migrant workers are not allowed to be joined or reunited by their family members. So in short, migrant workers are largely seen as workers. They can be allowed to work in sectors where they are needed, but they cannot be full members of the society of the destination country. Migrant workers thus are separated from their family members, hence we have the reality of transnational migration families in the region. Since large scale temporary migration started in the 1970s, Catholic institutions and actors have been part of the civil society organizations providing support to migrant workers. So the support comes in various forms. This could be in the form of information and education, providing legal assistance, counseling, training programs, and in the case of Catholic migrants, pastoral and spiritual support. Uh, despite the fact that the Catholic Church is a minority in the region, it has been able to harness its various resources to provide support to migrants. And Catholic Church institutions and actors are also among the voices advocating for policies to promote the protection of migrant workers. The pandemic has further exposed and reinforced the lack of protection to temporary workers. Due to the halt in economic activities worldwide, except in healthcare and domestic work, and also to some extent in agriculture and fishing, all other sectors where migrant workers are in, uh, notably in manufacturing, construction, sales, the hospitality industry, and transport, all of these have been affected by closures or temporary shutdowns. Hence, large numbers of migrant workers were displaced, or for those who were not laid off, they had to contend with reduced or delayed wages or on no work, no pay conditions. Um, in the past, in the face of crisis, repatriation was less complicated, but this time bringing migrant workers home met with massive difficulties because we have to contend with health screening, limited international flights, and of course, border closures, resulting to countless migrant workers being stranded. Many were left stranded in destination countries. Large numbers were without housing. Those in construction projects lived in cramped quarters, which posed more health hazards. 
and most of all, the fear of migrant workers as potential carriers of the virus fan the stigmatization of, and in some cases, discrimination against migrants. Therefore, displacement, loss of employment, and untimely return translates to economic hardship to the families of migrant workers. And unlike past crises, this time, it's like there's no way out of the situation. In the past, they would look for job opportunities for other, in other countries of destination, but this time that possibility is not there. And even job opportunities at home are also very bleak. So the pandemic therefore has exacted enormous toll on migrants and this presents a major challenge, not only to the church, but of course to all institutions in all societies. So I think I'll stop at that at this point. for sharing the challenges that migrant workers are facing in Asia, especially in the current COVID pandemic situation. Our second panelist is Elizabeth Ferris, research professor in the Institute for Study of International Migration at the Georgetown University and the Georgetown Law School. And she serves as a, an expert advisor to the United Nations Secretary General um, high level panel on internal displacement. She has worked and written extensively in the fields of international displacement, humanitarian assistance, refugees, and migration. Uh, Elizabeth, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And it's wonderful to be with you all today and talk about these important issues. As Father Leonair said, I teach at Georgetown University courses on refugees and migration and do a lot of research in different regions of the world. I also worked for about 15 years for the World Council of Churches in Geneva and traveled everywhere to see the amazing work that all churches and other faith-based organizations are doing on the ground to be with people who've been displaced or have moved for, for many different reasons. In the last few years, most of my work is focused on global policy issues. And I just want to say how important it has been to have a strong Catholic voice in these high-level discussions, often in you know, fancy meeting rooms with people speaking UN jargon and being very diplomatic. But over and over again, we've seen that Catholic organizations have been introduced a moral voice and said simply, this is wrong. We need to do better. We've got to look for better ways to respond to refugees and migrants and in all regions. I think the strength of Catholic organizations and other faith-based organizations stems from the fact that they have a strong moral gospel grounding, that they're rooted in their communities and can speak with great authenticity about what's happening in communities in ways that even excellent civil society and human rights organizations can't. They live there, they know the situation. And secondly, they have this global network where you can consolidate the, the input from you know, thousands and thousands of Catholic and other faith communities with, in, in response to these global challenges. You know, these are really tough times for people everywhere who care about immigrants and refugees. Certainly in the United States, we see a terrific anti-immigrant backlash and depend on people of faith to stand up and challenge the powers and the policies that are emerging. But I hope that you all realize that policies that are made in Washington reverberate around the world. When the US government cuts refugee resettlement numbers, as happened yesterday, yet again, that sends a clear message to people in other parts of the world. Well, if the United States, with all of its resources and its long tradition of welcoming immigrants, is doing this, why should we adopt different policies in a country with, with fewer resources? So when we talk about welcoming the stranger and building communities of hope, these are issues that certainly affect the individuals concerned and the, both those who are extending hospitality and those who are receiving it, but that these actions um, you know, echo around the world in terms of the the impact of decisions that are made in the United States for people in other countries. We see a diminishment of asylum in the United States, clearly, but we also see these practices being copied and replicated and sometimes justified by the fact that the United States is doing that. 
So if I can add a little bit of international dimension to our discussion here, to say that you know what's most important is what happens at the local level and the tremendous work that is being done and that we'll hear more about in this panel, but also for you to you know just understand that those decisions um, can have consequences for the world's 80 million displaced people and almost 300 million international migrants and people of faith who are trying to do the right thing in very different environments facing similar sorts of pressures. So I look forward to the discussion and thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, yes. Elizabeth. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth, Gracias, for sharing. Elizabeth, por compartir. I can hear the interpretation too, sorry. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing your extensive experience on global policy issues and from the academic at the United Nations field and the church and interfaith perspective. Thank you. Our third panelist is His Eminence Cardinal Alvaro Leonel Ramazzini Imeri. Uh, I will shift the language. Uh, Cardinal Ramazzini is Obispo de Huehuetenango, fue Obispo de um, San Marcos uh, de 2012 al 2018 y ha, y ha sido siempre muy comprometido con uh, los temas sociales, especialmente los derechos de los pueblos autóctonos de los migrantes y refugiados. Um, Cardinal Ramazzini, you have the floor. Ya. Yeah. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias. Gracias por la oportunidad de dirigirme a ustedes y gracias también por esta ocasión en esta actividad organizada por la Universidad de Notre Dame. Estamos ahora eh, viviendo aquí en Guatemala una situación que se puede volver muy complicada, puesto que desde hace dos días, en un número aproximado de 3,000 personas que han venido desde Honduras y que están tratando de pasar la frontera de Guatemala, muchos ya lo hicieron, y tratan de llegar hasta Estados Unidos pasando por México. Es un problema muy serio que puede crear realmente una conflictividad eh, internacional en las relaciones entre Honduras y Guatemala. Eh, anoche el presidente de Guatemala señalaba que por el bien de los guatemaltecos iban a tomar medidas de restricción al ingreso de todos estos hondureños, puesto que estamos ahora en el contexto de la pandemia del COVID-19 Y aquí en Guatemala, en muchos lugares del país, no hemos llegado todavía a bajar la curva de casos infectados con toda la problemática sanitaria que tiene nuestro país. Es decir, servicios médicos hospitalarios nacionales muy deficientes. No tenemos el número suficiente de pruebas para poder hacerlas a todos los habitantes del país las situaciones de, de pobreza que tenemos, que se mantienen, y esto hace que tengamos encima de la cabeza el fantasma del COVID-19. Y ahora, con la presencia de 3,000 personas a las cuales las autoridades nuestras les están exigiendo que al menos presenten un certificado de no estar contagiados del COVID-19, Ustedes pueden imaginarse lo que esto significa, es decir, como una bomba de tiempo que esperamos pueda encontrar causas de diálogo y causas de respeto a los derechos humanos. Creo que esta problemática así coyuntural de este momento que estamos viviendo está poniendo en la balanza, por un lado, el derecho que un país tiene de asegurar el bien común para sus ciudadanos, en este caso evitar el contagio del COVID, y en segundo lugar evitar también la conflictividad social, y por otro lado el respeto al derecho de migrar que las personas tienen cuando están viviendo situaciones como las que vive Honduras, El Salvador, 
y también nosotros aquí en Guatemala. Es decir, una situación de, de pobreza. Honduras es uno de los países, es el país más pobre de América Central. Eh, luego, países también con situaciones de violencia. En ese sentido, Guatemala, Honduras y El Salvador somos los países que tenemos un alto número de presencia de lo que nosotros aquí llamamos las maras, es decir, las pandillas juveniles que tienen un poder muy grande y que causan mucha violencia. Y luego la misma situación en Nicaragua, en donde pues el régimen del señor Ortega y su esposa es un régimen que está restringiendo las libertades, las libertades civiles de los nicaragüenses. Se escapa un poco Costa Rica en el sentido de no tener una conflictividad político-social como la tenemos nosotros, Guatemala, Salvador y Honduras, pero ellos se enfrentan a otro tipo de, de problemas, puesto que los niveles de pobreza en Costa Rica han ido creciendo en los últimos años y esa imagen de una Costa Rica pues muy tranquilo y muy próspero pues no está siendo ya así como se pensaba era y bueno Panamá con todo el problema de ser el, de ser el lugar del paso a donde están llegando africanos, están llegando haitianos, africanos de distintos países de África que están tratando de buscar la llegada hacia Estados Unidos en una palabra estamos ahora en una situación más aguda por toda la problemática del posible contagio del COVID-19, sin lograr una integración centroamericana que pudiera hacernos muy fuertes económicamente. Seguimos dependiendo de la economía norteamericana. No se ha logrado tampoco una relación de fortalecimiento de las relaciones económicos sociales con México. Teníamos esperanza de que con el presidente el obrador se pudiera lograr esto y sin embargo parece que no sigue viendo México hacia el sur, sino sigue viendo hacia el norte. Y entonces todos los problemas estructurales que tenemos están, están causando este, este flujo migratorio que prácticamente es como que salvémonos porque aquí no tenemos futuro. Estamos entonces ahora viviendo esta, esta situación bastante complicada. La Conferencia Episcopal de Guatemala pues, ha publicado un, un comunicado desde la Oficina de Movilidad Humana donde nosotros reafirmamos eh, el respeto a los derechos humanos, pero también reafirmamos el derecho de asegurar el bien común de los guatemaltecos. Son estas situaciones en las que hay que balancear el bien común y por otro lado los derechos individuales. Esto pues trae problemas éticos, problemas morales. Nosotros desde la oficina aquí pues estamos tratando de dar ayuda humanitaria, estamos tratando de estar presentes en esta situación, pero sí quería referirme a eso porque eh, una de las interpretaciones que se está haciendo de este fenómeno, de cómo en, un, en una semana 3,000 hondureños deciden eh, agarrar viaje, tomar viaje hacia Estados Unidos, una de las interpretaciones es que sucedió lo mismo cuando fue la elección de, del Congreso y de la Cámara de Representantes en Estados Unidos. Se dio también este fenómeno de las caravanas, se detuvo casi un año y ahora de cara a las, a las nuevas elecciones en Estados Unidos, pues uno se pone a pensar quién está manipulando todos estos flujos de tantas personas y qué intereses puede haber detrás de todo esto aparte del coyotismo, que es una plaga que nos destruye. Bueno, yo me quedo aquí, me pasé un poco de los minutos que me dieron, pero sí quería ponerlos en el contexto de lo que estamos viviendo ahora aquí en Guatemala. Thank you, Cardinal Ramazzini, for sharing the emergency that migrants are facing in Guatemala and Central America. and the uh, current situation uh, of a uh, pandemic, the situation of violent conflict, uh, neo caravanas and, uh, and how to balance the common good with the individual rights. This is the, one of the main questions that we will 
uh, face in the second part of our discussion, uh, how the Catholic Church can strengthen his uh, engagement on these issues of responding to the, the emergencies and uh, impact uh, the global agenda uh, on these issues. Our fourth panelist is Reverend uh, Robert Stark, Regional Coordinator for North America, Mexico, Central America, Caribbean for the Migrants and Refugees Section of the Dicastery for Human Development. He has worked extensively for social justice with migrant communities in the United States and Central America. Uh, Father Robert, you have the floor. Thank you, Father Nor E. Good morning to everyone. I'd like to begin by thanking the Center for Migration Studies and the Notre Dame University for organizing this conference. And a special thanks to all the panelists, uh, my fellow panelists and the moderator, for inspiring us with all you do to accompany migrants and refugees throughout the world. Since our, we, our panel was asked to address how Catholic institutions can strengthen their work in promoting integration, protection, and defense of persons with strong roots in sending and receiving communities, I'd like to just briefly focus on, on three points that are related to the teachings of Pope Francis. First, what does it mean to be a, an una iglesia sin fronteras, a church without borders? And second, how to hear the cry of the poor that Pope Francis talks about so often and do something concrete about it? And finally, third, how do we as a church, how can we collaborate across borders as we walk with our migrant brothers and sisters? First, now more than ever, Catholic institutions need to be leaders in building una iglesia sin fronteras. Pope Francis has called for the church to be a mother without borders, welcoming migrants fleeing violence, oppression, and poverty. Pope Francis repeated this message many times, including at the Juarez El Paso border. To be a church without borders is especially critical during this pandemic. When physical borders have been closed because of COVID-19, we all know that the, the impact of the coronavirus does not discriminate. It still crosses all borders revealing the reality, as Pope Francis reminded us, that we are all in the same boat. We are all in this boat together, and that we need to row together because the only way to come out of this storm is to do it together. For example, concretely, it will be vital for Catholic institutions to get involved, to fight for the fair global access the vaccines, especially the vaccine for the coronavirus, and fair access, especially for the most vulnerable in the world. Second, the message of Pope Francis for this year's World Day of Migrants and Refugees was an invitation to see, to come close to, to share with, and be involved with the poor on the peripheries. By getting involved with them in their stories, because each migrant, for example, has a past, a present, and a future. And by getting involved in their stories, we will be able to understand more fully how COVID-19 reveals that migrants are essential to both the sending and the receiving countries. Because of the pandemic, it is now even more clear how many countries depend on remittances sent home from their migrant workers. The coronavirus has also exposed the disproportionate number of migrants working on the front lines as essential workers in their host countries, providing basic services such as food production and healthcare. The Center for Migration Studies reports that 74% of all the undocumented workers in the United States are essential workers. 
risking their health and, and even their lives for others. The fact that migrants are essential for sending and receiving countries is all the more reason for the church institutions to accompany them through the different dioceses from their point of origin, transit, and to their destinations and accompany them as one church. Concretely, Catholic institutions can build a church without borders, providing access to essential resources such as shelter, legal aid, mental health, and other social services to all migrants in need. And third, as an Ecclesia Sin Fronteras, cross-border collaborations are vital in transforming our shared vulnerabilities into a communion of solidarity with migrants and refugees in order for us to build the future that we all need and build it together. Church institutions are called to create communities that not only collaborate with each other, but also celebrate our migrants' cultural roots while providing tools and skills to build a better future for all. Cross-border collaborations take real communication and teamwork between various parishes and community leaders and advocacy groups in different countries in countries of origin, countries of transit, and host countries. Concretely, some inspiring examples of, cro of cross-border collaborations include the Sponsorship Refugee Settlement Programs in Canada, courageous collaborations between the dioceses on the borders of the U.S. and Mexico and of Central America, and the creative construction of Puentes de Solidaridad bridges of solidarity among 10 Episcopal conferences throughout South America. Such cross-border church collaborations give us hope that indeed we can build together the future that we all need as a church without borders. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Father Robert, for sharing the, the perspective of Pope Francis inviting us to be committed with uh, an Iglesia Sin Fronteras, uh, with a strong collaboration between the churches of origin, uh, transit, and destination of migrants, and the collaboration with other uh, stakeholders. Um, our fifth panelist is Mark Munoz Viscoso, uh, the executive director of the Secretariat um, of Cultural D Diversity in the Church at the Conference of Catholic Bishops of the United States in Washington, D.C., where she previously served uh, as an assistant director of media relations. Before joining the, the Catholic Bishops uh, Conference, Mark worked worked uh, in the Archdiocese of Denver with the Hispanic Ministry and other services there. Uh, uh, Mario, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, and uh, good morning to everyone. And uh, thank you to um, the Center for Migration uh, Studies and others for uh, the opportunity to be here with you. So, um, you know, I just want to clarify, at the U.S. Bishops Conference, uh, the Secretariat of Cultural Diversity in the Church, uh, it's, uh, let's say, the pastoral side of things. If uh, Migration and Refugee Services does the policy and the advocacy and uh, the refugee resettlement, we are charged with, uh, to, with seeing to the pastoral care of uh, of the people especially those groups that require special attention and that includes the pastoral care of migrants refugees and travelers or as we call them people on the move uh, but it's not limited to that the secretariat is a very broad umbrella where uh, we have many diverse uh, populations and our uh, aim uh, our, our purpose is double for the in the on the one hand to promote intercultural competence among uh, uh, offices at the business conference but also catholic ministers ordain or lay uh, and the second purpose is to create awareness and provide the tools um, you know to and pastoral guidelines to help dioceses and parishes and catholic institutions 
to better serve uh, a number of cultural Negne families present in the United States, including African Americans, Asian and Pacific Islanders, Hispanics, Latinos, uh, Native Americans, and um, other immigrants coming from a variety of places such as Africa, the Caribbean, uh, Brazil, uh, even Eastern Europe. So in this context, in this variety of things, um, uh, today we're specifically talking about the pastoral care of migrants uh, and refugees and travelers. So as national organizations, how do we use this national platform to create awareness uh, and educate the faithful and the public uh, and promote collaborations that advance uh, immigrant integration? So I wanna propose three simple things that perhaps we can develop later during the dialogue. Uh, in the first place, I think that uh, we have heard a lot about advocacy and resettlement and policy uh, and social services, and they are very important, but I dare to say they don't exhaust the work of the church or address the need for the pastoral care and accompaniment of immigrants and refugees. We must not underestimate the need for pastoral and a spiritual care of the people as an integral part of a holistic approach to immigrant integration and to the well-being of the immigrant and refugee. Um, I just want to give two quick examples. I just was talking yesterday uh, with uh, Bishop Tyson in the Diocese of Jackima. He just came back from spending a couple of days with communities in the northern part of the diocese because it's a migrant community and their trailer uh, park was completely burnt out due to the fires. These are essential workers who are working now in picking up the crops that we receive in our uh, grocery stores. Uh, the bishop had to be there accompanying them, being present to them, listening to their sorrow, uh, weeping with them and celebrating mass with them. Um, it's something we learn uh, also from uh, a number of years ago with the number of unaccompanied minors in detention centers too, was the need that these young people had to talk to someone that were not officials from the government or ICE or anything. Some of them were Catholic and actually wanted to go to confession, but the majority of them just wanted someone they could trust to talk with. So this pastoral accompaniment of the people and the need they have for a spiritual care is also very important. And the church must be there for them uh, in their time on need. So I also venture to say that parishes, uh, diocese, and other ch church agencies can do a number of things. First of all, I think it's important uh, we're in, in, a, in a unique position to create a spaces of welcome. Uh, spaces of welcome where a sense of community, of uh, being a, a home away from home can be developed and tending to the spiritual needs of the immigrants once they arrive in the receiving communities. They play, these, these spaces play a crucial role in facilitating immigration, both in the faith community, but also in the local larger uh, uh, social fabric. Um, I also want to point out something important that sometimes is not uh, understood. Integration is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. And as such, it goes through several stages from welcoming to belonging to a stewardship, taking responsibility for the local community, including the faith communities. And so we must understand these stages uh, if we want to not just stay with the basic uh, needs of the immigrant or the refugee when, it, when he or she arrives, but also, you know, what is needed in order for them to feel that they belong in these communities that have received them and for them to say, I am going to be part of this and I am responsible for this community as well. And so I want to contribute um, to building up of this community and this society. So good integration work, uh, I would say, helps prepare both the receiving and the arriving community 
uh, understands the different stages and dynamics at play both for the new arrivals and for the long established communities and helps them move along those stages, avoiding the dangers of what I call ghettoization. Uh, and finally, I wanna add one more point, which is the church agencies must provide a spiritual care. We offer Catholic churches, Catholic institutions, we offer from what we have we help congregate the community we help create opportunities for prayer and faith formation and reception of the sacraments including in their own language and respectful of their own faith traditions and help them find connections to other faith traditions if they're not catholics and they are you know uh, available uh, in the in the area so i want to stop here i want to say pastoral care is an integral part of fulfilling the I was a stranger and you welcomed me direction provided by the Lord himself. Thank you, Omar, for, for sharing this uh, uh, holistic approach of the Catholic Church uh, with migrants and, and refugees. Um, in the opening remarks, uh, Elizabeth mentioned uh, that in his work and in this panel, she can share with us the global context of uh, the topic of our panel. So in order to have this global framework of the commitment of the church in the current situation and how the church can uh, better uh, promote the integration and protection defense programs, and their families. Elizabeth, can you please share with us uh, two main questions. First, how is the issue of integration being dealt with the global level, for example, in the uh, global compacts on refugees and migration, and in a, broad, in a more broad perspective, how the European approaches of integration in the US? So this global framework, first, if you can share with us, please. And second, how are the Catholic institutions shaping the global policy debates? How the Catholic Church is participating in these uh, um, global uh, debates and how can the Catholic Church and, uh, be more effective in tackling this global agenda? Uh, Elizabeth, please. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, the whole issue of integration of refugees has been on the church's agenda for a long, long time, and also increasingly on the world agenda. You know, 20 years ago, there was a big conference on integration of refugees that really picked up on what Mar was just saying. But perhaps going a step further, I mean, for integration to occur, an individual has to be willing to change but the society has to be willing to change as well. It has to be a two-way street where you see changes in the receiving community as well as the person trying to find a sense of belonging. So there's been an understanding of both the complexity, the fact that this is a process, you don't suddenly become integrated over, overnight. Um, but, but globally, you know, traditionally there are three solutions for refugees. You can go back home when things calm down, you can locally integrate, or you can be resettled in a third country. You know, more and more refugees are displaced for longer periods of time. The world average now is somewhere between 20 and 26 years if someone is a refugee. In those situations, local integration seems like the best alternative, say for Syrians in Jordan or Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. But the reality is that host governments, governments that have hosted large numbers of refugees for a long time, don't want local integration. They continue to see the presence of refugees as temporary. Sometimes that's for economic reasons. They have fear competition with their, their domestic labor force. Sometimes it's cultural or political reasons. But in the negotiation of these global compacts that took place in really 2016 to 2018, over and over again, we heard governments raising objections to even using the term integration. You know, we don't want to talk about local integration because it implies that they're going to stay forever. And certainly 
some governments, probably most, but not all governments in the world, see these movements as temporary. So even working on integration issues, which seems like a very non-controversial concept, has become very politicized on, on the global level. Um, I worked on helping to develop the New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants in 2016, which was a very strong human rights, refugee, migrant-centered document. And it was that way in part because of the influence of Catholic and other faith-based organizations. They came out very strong, proposing very specific language, worked very very strategically, very smartly with other civil society organizations in ways that the, the final documents had to reflect those inputs. And so I commend all of you who had some part in submitting ideas or suggestions to the UN during this time. So the New York Declaration was adopted in middle of the summer in September 2016. And six weeks later, we had the election of Donald Trump. So all, all these grand human rights, strong moral voice then became the subject of negotiation with much very different political interests by some of the political powers. We eventually ended up with two global compacts, one on migration, one on refugees at the end of 2018. These are both remarkable once in a lifetime documents you know, certainly, I think advocates would have liked them to be much stronger, but given the climate they were negotiated in, I mean, it's remarkable that almost all of the world's countries, except the United States, signed on to these. These documents are non-binding, they're not conventions, they're aspirational, but, you know, representing perhaps the, the common view that Number one, international cooperation is needed to deal with these. You can't go it alone when you're dealing with refugees and migrants. You need to involve other governments, other stakeholders, and you need to include civil society. These documents were much stronger because of the input of civil society, including Catholic and faith-based organizations generally, and um, they serve as a guide. It's now the, the, the hard task of holding governments and other stakeholders to account with what they promised to do. You know, whether it's ethical recruitment of migrant workers or sharing responsibility for refugees. So on the global level, I think that, you know, really commend the input of Catholic and other institutions who have made these documents stronger. But you know, it's one thing to have a beautifully crafted document on the shelf and another to translate it into actions that affect the lives of migrants and refugees. Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing uh, how the Catholic Church can uh, have a strong impact on the international agenda, working in collaboration with other uh, civil society organizations, with governments and uh, international organizations. Continuing in this uh, global perspective, uh, Father Robert, you are working in the dicastery of, uh, for promoting human development. And uh, can you please share with us uh, what is the role of uh, the, uh, how the, the Catholic Church is accompanying migrants and refugees, and especially in, in the context that we are working? Can you share some uh, hopeful examples of cross-border church collaborations in the Americas, as you mentioned? and other parts of the world, for example, Tex-Mex, we know so different. Uh, uh, collaboration. Uh, can you please share with us some hopeful examples of cross-border collaboration and uh, to strengthen our uh, into strengthening the uh, the pro protection and <clears throat> and uh, integration of migrants? Sure. Thank you, Father Lynn. Uh, I think that one of the most hopeful signs uh, of our being blessed to accompany and assist uh, the church as it accompanies the migrants and refugees around the world are cross-border collaborations. And here in the Americas, we have some really excellent and really inspiring examples of hopeful collaboration. Uh, you just mentioned uh, the Tex-Mex bishops, which are the bishops in Texas and Mexico along the border. They meet twice a year and they've come up with a whole series of uh, mutual projects 
but really it gives a chance for those bishops to literally collaborate with one another and their group, their parishes and their diocese collaborate. I'll give you an example. Uh, recently, the Diocese of El Paso, uh, Bishop Mark Seitz and the uh, incredible diocese that he has, uh, they work, many of the people that, it's because it's El Paso, it's basically a, a border community that s sits right across and neighbors with Juarez, Mexico. And the Diocese of El Paso has, has uh, put together a border refugee uh, relief fund. And they put it together in order to literally, as Pope Francis is called, to be good Samaritans, to literally be about uh, caring for our neighbors. And many of the people in the diocese, of course, in El Paso are migrants that came over from uh, Mexico and from Central America. And in particular, this border uh, fund, relief uh, refugee fund, just recently, actually during the week of the migrant World Day for Migrants and Refugees, they opened up, they, they went over and helped uh, open up centers in the diocese and in the parishes of Juarez, Mexico, where pregnant women who are uh, migrant women who have been waiting for their asylum and reached the border, but because of the return to Mexico policy, are living in very difficult circumstances in Juarez and some of the really dangerous neighborhoods as well, that parishes are lifting up centers uh, where these, uh, their brothers and sisters and the families of migrants can go and the diocese there provides resources, the diocese of El Paso provides resources into the diocese of Juarez so that they can receive uh, uh, medical care for a pregnancy as well as mental health counseling because of the trauma that they've gone through and the trauma that's being intensified by their waiting there as well as the COVID-19 uh, trauma that they're all experiencing along the border. And also has provided uh, just simple things like safety um, packages to the, or what do you call first aid packages to the parishes that are, are uh, assisting migrants and refugees. But this cross-border collaboration has many forms along the border, Sister Norma, uh, Pimatel down in McClellan with Matamoros has amazing work going on on both sides of the border as well as well as the Kino border initiative project up in Nogales along uh, in Arizona and the Mexico border where they're actually helping my uh, uh, organize migrants to actually have a voice to express their voice to not be uh, hidden or forgotten or in the shadows as Pope Francis often says that COVID actually gives us a chance to actually see what are and who are in the shadows. And they are essential to these countries, uh, not only the origin, but even uh, become essential to the countries of transit as well as their host countries. Another example, a similar example is in the Dominican Republic and Haiti, the bishops there as well, the conference, the commissions on migration, both in the Dominican Republic and in Haiti meet twice a year and collaborate on projects, particularly there, it happens to be the same project that is pregnant women particularly from Haiti, that are going across to the Dominican Republic to receive care, uh, both prenatal and postnatal care. Uh, and you have, an, uh, I think one of the really amazing examples in the Americas is a project that the 10 Episcopal conferences have put together in South America. There's 10 Episcopal conferences coordinating with each other throughout South America to accompany the Venezuelan of some of the 5 million Venezuelan migrants that are now spreading throughout the world. And these, this collaboration includes very, very practical things about helping them sort of uh, the diocese and the conferences coordinating with each other so that they can provide temporary housing, not just temporary housing, but work permits and school coordinated, schooling coordinated between the countries. And this extends out into the Caribbean, for example, the, the country of Trinidad and the Archdiocese of Fort of Spain in Trinidad is actually receiving thousands of migrants from uh, Venezuela and actually taking responsibility for the education of them in uh, Trinidad itself. So those are just some examples, I think, of what uh, are coming to be real gems of hope that we can together build this future that we all need. And I think the cross-border collaborations, not just in the Americas, we share those through the uh, section of migrants and refugees, we share them with a similar and inspiring 
collaborations in other parts of the world, but I just wanted to share the ones in the Americas. Thank you, Father Robert, for sharing these uh, hopeful experiences, uh, including the Tex-Mex, El Paso, the, and other initiatives in Latin America to, um, to serve and protect uh, Venezuelan migrants uh, with this then Conference of Catholic Bishops. In the same perspective of cross-border church collaboration, uh, we would like to invite Cardinal Ramazzini to share the commitment of the church in Central America on the promotion of integral human development and the protection of migrants. So uh, Cardinal Ramazzini, can you please, from your extensive experience, to share with us how is the church, the Catholic Church contributing for human development and migrant in integration in both sending and receiving countries and communities in Central America. You mentioned in your intervention how to balance the common good with the individual rights. Uh, how the, the Catholic Church and the Catholic institutions are uh, promoting this development and how is the church shaping the migration policies in, in Central America? Bien. Muchas gracias, eh, Padre Leonid. Tengo que decir que nosotros en América Central, desde Guatemala hasta Panamá, estamos organizadas las conferencias episcopales en lo que nosotros llamamos el Secretariado Episcopal de América Central, que tiene una tradición de, de existencia muy antigua. Nos reunimos una vez al año. Y en esa reunión, pues indudablemente uno de los temas que no ha faltado, yo tengo 30 años de participar en esta reunión, tengo 30 años de ser obispo, nunca en estas reuniones ha faltado el tema de los migrantes. Y desafortunadamente para nosotros obispos hablar o discutir, reflexionar, hacer propuestas, denuncias públicas, eh, declaraciones, muchas veces resulta, resulta frustrante, porque ustedes saben que a nivel de América Central, la separación iglesia y Estado es muy clara. Es decir, en el caso de Guatemala, el Estado de Guatemala es un Estado laico, laico por definición en la misma constitución y entiendo que así es en los demás países, aunque ahora claro, dentro del contexto de los países de América Central, la situación de Nicaragua está siendo muy, muy especial por todo lo que están viviendo los hermanos y hermanas nicaragüenses. Si nosotros partimos de este supuesto de que somos, de que es un estado laico, Muchas veces tenemos que movernos con mucho cuidado para poder ir realizando todo nuestro trabajo de apoyo a los migrantes. En el sentido de que hay legislaciones nacionales eh, muy claras y muchas veces muy estrictas y muy rígidas que impiden el que las personas que vengan de, de otros países puedan integrarse en el propio país. Pero a esto también hay que añadir el dato de que Guatemala es un país de tránsito de migrantes y es un país expulsor de migrantes. Es decir, hablar entonces de una integración de los migrantes aquí en Guatemala, si hablamos, por ejemplo, cuando comenzó toda la problemática en Cuba, muchos cubanos vinieron y se establecieron en Guatemala y lograron entrar en el mundo de los negocios y de las empresas. Pero eh, si hablamos, por ejemplo, de los venezolanos, sí han pasado venezolanos por aquí, pero van hacia Estados Unidos. Si hablamos de, bueno, africanos y haitianos están pasando aquí, pero buscando Estados Unidos. E igual sucede con los guatemaltecos, con los salvadoreños y con los hondureños. Es decir, Guatemala es un país de tránsito de todos estos migrantes que están yendo hacia Estados Unidos. De hecho, hace un momento estaba hablando con el padre Juan Luis Carvajal, que es el secretario aquí de nuestra comisión, que me señalaba 
que a pesar de las declaraciones muy fuertes que el presidente de la República ha hecho, sin embargo, tenemos ya cientos de hondureños que ya pasaron la frontera entre Honduras y Guatemala y van camino al norte de Guatemala, a un lugar que se llama Petén, que es fronterizo con México. Y ya también eh, leí ya una declaración que esta mañana hizo el presidente López Obrador, donde da una interpretación que realmente hay toda una motivación política de cara a las próximas elecciones en Estados Unidos en empujar a todas estas caravanas, que estamos hablando de 3.000 personas. 3.000 personas para un país con los niveles de pobreza que tiene Guatemala, que no es capaz de darle comida a sus propios habitantes, con índices de desnutrición crónica infantil que llegan al 55%, en un país en donde el desempleo, el índice de desempleo es altísimo, ustedes entonces se pueden imaginar qué apoyo podemos dar nosotros a los migrantes que pasan por aquí si no es un apoyo humanitario, coyuntural, de poder ayudarlos en las necesidades básicas. Eso si tratamos el tema desde nuestra respuesta cristiana, hacia los migrantes que están pasando por aquí y que han venido pasando y pasando en los últimos años. El otro punto importante para nosotros es el, el seguir haciendo un trabajo y en eso el Episcopado de América Central lo tratamos de hacer y hemos participado aquí mismo en Notre Dame hace unos años se organizó una actividad hemos tratado de hacer trabajo de lobby con la Conferencia Episcopal de Estados Unidos aunque en los últimos años menos, para tratar de lograr incidir en políticas de respeto humano a los migrantes. No hemos logrado en todos estos años de esfuerzos que Estados Unidos, por ejemplo, ratifique el convenio que pueda asegurar la reunificación de las familias de los migrantes en Estados Unidos. Ha sido una lucha imposible, en la que hemos entrado también en relación con los obispos de, de de Estados Unidos, que ya mencionaba Robert, la, la buena relación que nosotros tenemos también con los obispos que se han involucrado en Estados Unidos en todo este, en todo este tema. No hemos logrado ni siquiera eso, que es un convenio aprobado por la Organización Internacional del Trabajo, solo por poner un ejemplo. En segundo lugar, eh, hemos venido haciendo todo un trabajo de incidencia delante del gobierno mexicano que al final ha dado como resultado el que México sí firmó ese convenio de reunificación de las familias de los trabajadores temporales. Y en segundo lugar, actualmente, la política de, de México, pues aunque en un principio, en las caravanas del año pasado, fue muy rígida y fue muy frontal, sin embargo, pues después dijeron, entren y, y vamos a ver aquí qué pasa con ustedes. En ese sentido, mantenemos también una relación con el Episcopado mexicano, con los obispos responsables de, de lo que ellos llaman la sección de, de, de migraciones, para poder hacer un trabajo de lobby que pueda dar resultados. Pero muchas veces, de veras, solamente porque Dios nos da la virtud de la esperanza, es que seguimos adelante. Porque al, al realizar todos los esfuerzos que se hacen, toda la lucha que hacemos, etcétera, vemos que los resultados que hemos logrado son pocos. Hablar de integración de migrantes que pasan por Guatemala, sí, ha habido casos en los cuales se han quedado aquí, nicaragüenses se han quedado, costarricenses se han quedado, salvadoreños se han quedado y han logrado integrarse dentro de la, dentro de la comunidad eh, nacional. Pero no tenemos que olvidar que Guatemala es un país plurietnico. Es decir, nosotros mismos no podemos hablar de una integración nacional, porque el racismo aquí en Guatemala desgraciadamente sigue siendo una plaga. No podemos hablar de una integración del país de todas, de todas las etnias y con nosotros que somos los ladinos. Es un esfuerzo que se está haciendo. El nivel de pobreza en Guatemala ha venido aumentando en los últimos años. Y entonces nosotros, desde Guatemala, lo que buscamos hacer es 
mantener una relación de acompañamiento con todos los guatemaltecos que están en los Estados Unidos sin su documentación legal, pero que se han ido integrando dentro de las comunidades, aunque es un detalle muy importante decirlo, puesto que en los últimos años yo he visitado muchas comunidades de guatemaltecos en Estados Unidos, cómo a ellos les cuesta integrarse aún en las comunidades católicas en Estados Unidos. Porque no es que todas las comunidades católicas en Estados Unidos, hablo de las parroquias, sean parroquias que abran los, bar, los brazos y que traten de igual a igual a nuestros paisanos. Eso muchas veces no sucede. Y eso a pesar de los esfuerzos que yo sé que algunos párrocos hacen. Algunos párrocos lo hacen y luchan por lograr la integración, pero muchas veces dentro de los mismos miembros de las comunidades católicas en Estados Unidos, de gente norteamericana o de gente que ya se asentó en Estados Unidos, no es que tengan una actitud de acogida hacia los, hacia los guatemaltecos. Y si son indígenas, marcados por esa, ese complejo de inferioridad fruto de la historia guatemalteca, a ellos mismos les cuesta integrarse. He conocido en Estados Unidos grupos de guatemaltecos que se reúnen aparte, el párroco les permite utilizar la iglesia, pero no se logra la integración. Yo creo que el tema de la integración no, no lo tenemos que ver solamente aquí en América Central, puesto que mal que bien somos centroamericanos, sino que hay que verlo más hacia el norte, en el sentido de México y de Estados Unidos. Sin embargo, en medio de todo esto, yo tengo que reafirmar dos eh, elementos muy importantes. Hoy por hoy, la economía guatemalteca se sostiene por las remesas que mandan los paisanos que están trabajando en Estados Unidos. Y vean ustedes que aún ahora, en este tiempo de la pandemia, desde el mes de marzo hasta el mes de junio, el número de, de dinero de remesas bajó muchísimo. Pero a partir de julio y agosto, volvió de nuevo a subir. Eso es un indicativo de cómo hay una manera de ser solidaria que no es tan pública. Y un tema que ahora aprovecho de una vez para decirlo, un tema que hemos venido siempre discutiendo es cómo podemos lograr que las tasas de interés de los bancos, que son los que hacen las transferencias de los dólares aquí, pueda ser una tasa de interés que baje del 7% que baje al 1%, porque por cada dólar o por cada 100 dólares que un guatemalteco envía aquí, le quitan 7 dólares. Es decir, es un tema que yo creo que ahora valdría la pena que desde, desde la universidad o desde ustedes que trabajan en estos temas más técnicos pudieran verlo, porque hace años que venimos hablando de esto. Bueno, eh, estamos ahora entonces en esta situación en la que a pesar de la pandemia, muchos guatemaltecos siguen buscando ir al norte. Ahora los hondureños están buscando ir al norte. Las declaraciones de López Obrador son a saber qué movida política hay ahora delante de las elecciones del señor Trump. No sé cómo andan las relaciones entre México y Estados Unidos, pero da tristeza que se utilice a los migrantes empobrecidos que sufren la violencia que sufren la persecución de las maras en sus países, etcétera, etcétera, que sean manipulados de un modo político parcial. Eso duele y eso indigna, porque realmente son personas que merecen todo el respeto. Que hay coyotismo, sabemos que hay coyotismo. Que hay eh, eh, bandas criminales que se aprovechan en la trata de personas, en todo esto, sabemos que lo hay. Por eso, qué bueno que sigamos hablando de toda esta temática para ir creando una mayor conciencia eh, mundial, internacional sobre esto. Bueno, tendría más cosas que decir, pero me quedo aquí porque sé que tengo solamente un tiempo limitado. Thank you, Cardinal Ramazzini, uh, for sharing the, the responses of collaboration between churches of origin, transit, and destination of migrants in Central America, the humanitarian responses, as you mentioned, to people crossing Guatemala in the context of poverty, but the, the commitment of the church with the migrants crossing territory of Guatemala, 
and the protection of Guatemalans abroad, and in addition of the advocacy work for the definition of new policies and programs protecting the dignity of migrants. The two main challenges that you mentioned in the beginning is a topic for Elizabeth uh, in, your, in your work in the future. Uh, the, the challenges of uh, discussion of, from academic level and other uh, Catholic institutions, how to be committed with the, um, with the reduction of remittances of, to migrants and the high level of uh, banks' interest uh, for migrants, how to, to deal with this situation with more collaborative uh, perspective of academic with people working in the field in the Conference of Catholic Bishops pushing the, the, the dignity of migrants uh, who are losing the, the results of their work because of uh, this high level of uh, rate interest. Um, continuing in the, in the um, uh, Western Hemisphere, uh, Mark, can you please provide some concrete examples of what can be done uh, from your experience on the Conference of Catholic Bishops in the United States, how can be done to strengthen our um, integration of uh, migrants in receiving communities, uh, how to facilitate my migrant integration in the, at the parish level or regional level, and uh, how can we expand the collaboration as Cardinal Ramazzini mentioned, how can we expand the collaboration between the receiving uh, church, receiving communities with the communities of origin? Many of the migrants in North America are from Mexico or Central America. How can we strengthen our collaboration and solidarity between the church of origin, transit, and destination? Please, uh, Mark. Thank you. Um, actually, um, First of all, I want to um, mandar un saludo a uh, Monsignor Ramazzini. Uh, my greetings, uh, because uh, es un pastor con olor a oveja, usando el lenguaje del Papa Francisco. Uh, he's, a, he's a true shepherd, a true pastor, uh, with the smell of the sheep, to use Pope Francis's language. Uh, he's been coming year after year to accompany the uh, indigenous and the Guatemalan communities here in the United States and our secretariat works, uh, you know, in close collaboration with the Pastoral Maya and His Eminence has been a continuous presence accompanying the, the communities here in the North. Gracias, Monseñor, muchas gracias. So I want to give you very quick, uh, concrete examples you asked for. So I think uh, in, in several areas, first of all, I think uh, one of the things that can be done and the, the conference is doing through our secretariat is help pastors and ministry leaders acquire the intercultural competence and the, the, the formation that they need uh, to accompany migrants. And that means working and helping them in acquiring both knowledge, skills, but also pastoral conversion and changing attitudes, both of the pastors and their teams. Uh, so there are a number of things and tools that can be used. The conference has put together a curriculum called Building Intercultural Competence uh, for, for, for Ministers, best practices for shared parishes, creating a culture of encounter, which is an adaptation of the recent fifth encuentro for Latino ministry that can be used for any other communities. Our, our churches in the United States, despite of everything that we're hearing in the rhetoric, are uh, becoming more and more diverse. And we need to do this work of integration of the communities, which includes the immigrant and refugee, but many other communities that now are you know, uh, being brought together, uh, you know, in, under a common roof and using common spaces, etc. So we do need to build uh, the pastor and their team's intercultural competence. But also, as Father uh, Bob, uh, you know, Father Stark was saying, I think uh, it's important to do other things in diocese and, and 
in bishops uh, it can do other things. For example, in our case, the conference does a yearly pastoral visit to migrants. And every year it chooses a different part of the country in a different industry uh, to, to go there, visit them, listen to their concerns, see how they're doing, uh, what are identifying what are the needs both uh, you know, physical needs and social needs, uh, but also, you know, spiritual needs, and then try to convey that to, uh, you know, whomever needs to know about it, both, you know, the, the, the structures in the diocese, but also, uh, you know, the legislators in Congress uh, and, and, and others. Uh, last year, for example, we conducted a, a visit across the border. Uh, we went to El Paso and, uh, and, and also to Juarez, and this is important because we brought along our colleagues, our colleagues from other departments of the conference, and we brought along our colleagues from other surrounding dioceses so that we could look together at the plea of migrants from both sides of the border. Uh, and, and so I think it was important, and also specifically to the migrant farm workers in the area of New Mexico, which we also, we also win. So these are concrete things that can be done. And I would encourage, uh, you know, and diocese and even uh, uh, regions, you know, within the country to come together and organize this because it really is, helps people, uh, I, you know, open their eyes and open their hearts. Uh, to what's going on and to un better understand the question. Uh, another thing that um, can be done are uh, offering, you know, a training for parishioners and the receiving communities, both for those who welcome uh, and, and, and are called to minister to the newly arrivals, uh, but also to uh, the communities that, that, that arrive. And I want to give one example. Uh, when we started Centro San Juan Diego in the Archdiocese of Denver, this was the philosophy behind it. That we, you know, on the one hand, our, you know, our, our, our population, our, our immigrant population, mostly from Mexico, boomed, was booming. The, the parishes needed helpers, the parishes needed catechists, but also along that, we needed you know, the people came with a lot of needs, you know, um, uh, physical uh, and needs. And, and so we, we needed to identify what those were and help the parishes deal with that. So I would, I would venture to say that the more, um, you know, the services and the information that we provide to the immigrant community arriving uh, are oriented, the more they are oriented to helping them build skills and acquire um, the knowledge that they need to succeed in American society, the most successful we, and by that mean they and us together, will be in the work of integration. Just to give you an example, in Centro San Juan Diego, we would provide, uh, you know, services such as English as a second language, acquiring general education degree, um, uh, how to start your own business, understanding taxes and, uh, and helping them with tax preparation, immigration clinics, citizens in services for those who become eligible to become citizens. And I remember uh, at the time, the local director of the Citizenship and Immigration Services, Mr. Mario Ortiz, telling me, Mar, I know when they are coming from Centro San Juan Diego, they come well prepared for the interviews. And there was something very satisfying about that, about knowing that we were doing in a service to the migrants and to society, uh, and we were working together. Um, I very briefly, I would say that uh, there, uh, you know, I would say offer services to anyone in need, uh, you know, uh, it, regardless of creed, of nationality, or ethnic origins. As Centro San Juan Diego, we would see anybody who came to us in need and see how we could help them. And I want to point out to one more thing, and it's the role of Catholic schools. Uh, well, actually, before I go to that, I want to say sometimes parishes are overwhelmed, but we can and we have examples. I mentioned Denver. There is other examples in, in, uh, in California and other dioceses. Uh, in Washington DC here at Centro Hispano, where we are able to create this Paris diocesan partnerships uh, that can help us work together uh, on, on putting together these services and provide the services. And I wanna finish with another concrete uh, example and call, which is the role of Catholic schools. 
you know, over a century ago, the system of parochial schools in this nation, in this country was born, certainly to fulfill the, the mission of evangelization of the church, but the, with the principal aim of educating the poor and integrating the children of immigrants. So I venture to say here, I dare to say Catholic schools in the United States must rediscover their proud history and apply the same creative creativity and generosity of previous generations in the current circumstances. And I understand our Catholic schools are struggling, they are, they are, but so were the immigrant communities uh, who created them, you know, to begin with. Uh, and also, especially the institutions of higher education uh, play a special role in helping immigrants advance their education and break the glass ceiling. Sometimes it feels like a concrete ceiling uh, that many seem to hit where they can go to a certain level, but no beyond that. So I would sit uh, the microphone back to you, uh, Father Leonir. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for sharing the, the commitment and the concrete examples of the Catholic Church commitment, especially the, the last topic that you mentioned, the commitment of the Catholic schools. Uh, Marla, uh, you mentioned in, the, in your opening remarks that migrant workers are facing critical situations in Asia. Can you please share with us how are Catholic institutions addressing the needs of migrant workers in Asia during this pandemic? And what are the, some of the lessons learned from the, this pandemic uh, as the church Catholic institution reflects on the ways forward? Uh, considering the time constraints, uh, if you can please, uh, Marla, share this um, response. Okay. Your response yes. in, in a short time, yes, and then um, we will give the time for other speakers. Yes. Thank you very much. But uh, just very quickly, uh, based on just to follow up on what Mar has shared, I think it's also very important to have a training for pastoral workers that are involved in the ministry with migrants. And we've had some concrete example here in Asia uh, of providing a formal training to those that are involved in the migrant ministry so that they also have an appreciation and to be able to place the work that they do within the context of the social teaching of the church and also the biblical traditions that inspire uh, the work that we do in this particular area. Well, during this time of the pandemic, of course, uh, the Catholic Church and other church institutions here in the region also had a lot of problems in um, faced a lot of uh, challenges because of our forced immobility. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, many Catholic institutions have been able to extend support to migrants, for example, in destination countries. Um, the, the, I, I think the, uh, uh, the, the church has been quite very creative in moving a lot of the services that it traditionally offers on a face-to-face -face basis by moving these services online. So aside from the online masses, we see a lot of examples in destination countries like Singapore and, uh, and Korea and other destination countries here in the region of providing online services. And I've seen also uh, in some examples in Korea that in addition to, you know, um, even the, uh, the, they've also done quite a lot in providing um, um, in making known that these services are available in different uh, in different languages, so uh, a lot of the online counsel, uh, a lot of the counseling as well as accompaniment has been uh, conducted online, and even in the work with seafarers. No? So they used to hold masses in the gangway, but now it's not possible. So things have to be conducted online as well, um, and also um, there are many examples in Taiwan, in Korea and uh, as well as in Singapore of uh, many church organizations and actors really uh, being very active in uh, extending support to migrants by providing them with food packs and also uh, very essential health kits, alcohol, face masks, and the like, um, and uh, venturing out to, to where the migrants are because uh, for certain types of workers, like for example, the fishermen who are working there in Taiwan, they cannot really go out to the stores and uh, you know uh, join the queue to get their share of the face mask. And so what uh, uh, 
uh, volunteers have done is uh, actually to reach out to these people so that uh, they can be provided with essential care. I think one lesson among the many lessons and uh, inspirations that we can learn from this particular experience is that even if migrants, we generally tend to think of them as uh, those that are at the receiving end of the solidarity of, of acts of solidarity, migrants also uh, are agents of solidarity themselves. And just to maybe um, cite uh, a very specific example, I was very much inspired by the story of uh, Father uh, Trantiet, no, a Scalabrinian missionary in Taipei. Uh, they got to find out about the situation of international students who are not able to support themselves because they cannot work part-time since many of the companies shut down or were slowing down in their operations. So the church in St. Christopher, they offered a food bank. And uh, early on, uh, the students would come and some of the distressed workers would come to avail of the food supplies that they could get from there. But later on, the students also started to volunteer. And then the students later decided that, oh, they can probably also give um, uh, food packs you know, to the homeless uh, in, in Taipei. And how did they do this? They did this by, uh, you know, catering to an elderly home. And from the proceeds, they were able to get enough money. So that the, that was the starting point of their serving the homeless. And now they're also serving uh, a group of children in some homes that are that are disadvantaged. So what I'm trying to say is that migrants themselves can be instruments of solidarity as well. And they bear gifts. They bear gifts. And, and also from a sharing of one missionary that one of the important lessons that he learned from the migrants is really their resilience and strength in facing adversities like the pandemic. So I'll stop at that. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you Marla. Um, and we have five minutes left from our conference. So uh, in our questions, I raised the questions of uh, um, the audience. Some of the questions that uh, I presented to you, I presented from the, some of the audience uh, people participate in the, the panel. So now in the last five minutes, uh, uh, I invite you, you, each panelist to take a minute for their final remarks and your call for the call to action. What can we do to strengthen our uh, integration and commitment of the Catholic Church? We can start with Cardinal Ramazzini, please. The final remarks and the call bueno, to action. Yeah. Yo considero que uno de los grandes llamados que el Papa Francisco está haciendo es el de una iglesia en salida y sobre todo el volver a, a darle énfasis a lo que el Evangelio nos pide. Muchas veces él ha citado el capítulo 25, versículo 32 en adelante del Evangelio de San Mateo. Yo fui forastero y, y tú me acogiste. Ven a gozar de la vida eterna. Muchos cristianos católicos no están viviendo este radicalismo evangélico. Y eso hace que aún gente de la política, gente de la economía, no tomando conciencia de lo que significa vivir el evangelio, están realizando lo que el Papa Juan Pablo II vino a decirnos aquí en Guatemala en 1982, cuando estábamos en el conflicto armado y vino a decir, no hay que separar fe de la vida. Y yo creo que ese sigue siendo el desafío para todos y todas. Unir la fe con la vida. Es mi comentario. Muchísimas gracias, Cardenal Ramazzini. Elizabeth, please. Okay. Thank okay. Thank yeah. you, Elizabeth. In, in thinking about what can be done, I think the best thing is get to know refugees and migrants that have, knowing them as human beings, smiling, talking about kids, school, whatever. You know, it really, really builds bridges. The research is really clear. The people who know refugees and immigrants generally feel positively. Those who only listen to the rhetoric or read the generalizations in the newspaper can have much more 
negative views. And to pick up on what Mars said earlier, I think visits to the border are really essential. It's a transformative experience to see what's happening on both sides of our border and think about what it means for, for our country. Um, we took a group of students to the border this March, right before the pandemic, and all of those students' lives were changed. You know, they cared about migrants before, but actually seeing what U.S. policy was doing really changed them in ways that I think will yield results over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Father Robert, please. Yes, I'd just like to lift up and connect also with uh, something that Maruha said, but uh, point towards an example of it, and that is the, the real importance of in, involving uh, migrants and refugees in the ministry themselves. That, the, as Pope Francis says, there is no solution without migrants and refugees being the protagonists. They have the answers with us to do that, and I think that it's really important. And I want to lift up the work that uh, Cardinal uh, uh, Ramasini is doing with the Mobilidad Humana in Guatemala because it's one of the real stellar examples of how they have been able to integrate in a vital and central and uh, very important way migrants as part as protagonists of their own uh, destiny and we have a lot to learn from and with them. Thank you Father Robert. Ma Marla please. Thanks very much. Uh, I think uh, one important thing that we can do and something that's very doable is also to share these many narratives of the gifts that migrants bring with them. You know? um, because that will also change, um, that will also help change public opinion and also correct misconceptions about migrants. And I think one, one gift that uh, the COVID-19 has given to us is uh, the discovery that we can do a lot of things also online and hopefully we can invest in this uh, technology uh, to uh, promote more coordination between churches of origin and churches of destination. Thanks. Thank you, Marla. And Mar, your final remarks. Yes, I, uh, I would actually um, second the idea that we must uh, depoliticize the issue of immigrant integration the same way that we have to do it with racism and look at it with gospel's eyes and not with uh, political parties uh, affiliations eyes and the more we can do to lobby our our communities of faith to remember uh, that we'll be judged on whether you know uh, I was a stranger and you welcomed me I think that's important the other point I, I want to finish with is the idea of let's look at it also from the point of, of, uh, of view of integration versus assimilation you know the assimilation the, the forced assimilation approach forces people to become someone else to look and act and to speak to behave in public uh, you know in a certain way in order to belong um, it's a different process than the process of acculturation uh, in, and I think we need to look at it from the point of view of processes of immigration, of, of integration that help people set, settle, adapt to a new community, uh, enable them to understand the inner work is, uh, you know, and help them be successful. Uh, and see those communities not as a threat, but as an enrichment of our society and our culture here. Um, and I think it's important for that to happen, to create opportunities uh, for, for cultural and ethnic and religious groups to come together and interact in, in participate in moments of celebration together, both in the civic and in the religious community. Thank you, Mark. Uh, concluding this panel, I would like to thank uh, all the panelists uh, for participating in this panel, uh, Cardinal Ramazzini, Elizabeth, Mar, Marla, and Father Robert. Thank you for your uh, participation. Thank you for the Center for Migration Studies and the University of Notre Dame. And thank you to all of you who have been part of this uh, uh, panel. Uh, thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>